communications here at the Milken Institute. And it is my distinct pleasure to have with us this morning Najib Gadban, who is the special representative to the United States for the National Coalition of Syrian Revolutionary and Opposition Forces, which from now on I'm just going to call the Syrian Opposition Coalition, if that's OK. okay. Mr. Gadban is a pro-democracy activist, a professor of political science at the University of Arkansas. He has been active in the Syrian de democracy movement for many years, including as a signatory to the Damascus Declaration in 2005, and a co-founder of the Syrian National Coalition, uh, National Council in 2011. Uh, just to set the stage here, for those of you who don't know, the Syrian Opposition Coalition is the main political organization uh, that is made up of opposition groups in the Syrian civil war. It was founded in Doha last November. And the main aims of the National Coalition are replacing the Bashar al-Assad government, its symbols and pillars of support, dismantling the security services, and unifying and supporting the Free Syrian Army. So welcome. It's an honor to have you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the Milken Institute, uh, for you, Skip, for a friend of mine, uh, Ahmad Zubayri, who actually connected me with this, and for everyone uh, for the opportunity to talk to you. So just to let you know, uh, we're going to talk for a little bit here. Then we are going to open up to questions. There are microphones. Love to have your questions. Um, to begin, before we get in, there's obviously a lot to talk about. I thought we'd just sort of get a little background on you, if we might. And I think the first question that comes to my mind is, how in the world does a University of Arkansas professor end up as the head of the Syrian Opposition Coalition representative here in the United States? Tell us your story. How did you get here? Well, and Could you um, turn up, please pull up slide one, just so we have a, a reference here. OK, this is a map of Syria. Uh, I'm originally from the suburb of Damascus. I left that country uh, in the 80s, early 80s. Uh, during the um, times of Assad, the father, uh, it was a very, in fact, uh, brutal era, uh, that, uh, the early 80s. Uh, in a Human Rights Watch report, they called the early 80s as the greatest depression, you know, repression era in Syria. Um, and uh, I left, in fact, personally. My friends were arrested. They were high school, first-year uh, university students. Uh, so I went uh, to the Emirates where I studied political science, came to this country, did my graduate work, and then uh, I became, um, uh, you know, I entered into the academia. And my specialization and my interests are Middle East politics with focus on democratization and Syrian politics. And you told me you kind of got away from Syrian democratic movements for a little while. And then how did you get back in? How did you get the, your current position? Well, uh, with the coming uh, of Bashar al-Assad to power in 2000, many of us felt there was an opportunity, uh, an opportunity to urge this you know, young president to introduce reform. Um, we had a lot of hope, which in fact, they were raised by his inaugural speech. He did talk a little bit about reform. Uh, he did acknowledge the other point of view. And we were hoping he would lead Syria into a, a new course away from his father's um, model. Uh, unfortunately, that was frustrated uh, right after uh, six months into this. There was a movement called the Damascus Spring Movement, in which activists, uh, human rights activists, democracy advo uh, advocates, were actually uh, just opening forums. And um, um, eventually, the regime decided to crack down on that. Um, it's always find it you know, um, convenient um, to use regional challenges to crack down on the internal dissent. So by 2001, the leading figures of the Damascus uh, Spring Movement were arrested, uh, 10 of them, and they were sentenced between two and a half years to 10 years in prison. Then there was another moment, and I think this is important to setting just the, the stage and the context. In 2005, there was a uh, widespread movement called the Damascus Declaration Movement. It was, again, another gathering of activists. At the height of it, about 270 activists from across the country, in Syria, you see, from the far northeast all the way to the southwest, gathered and they formed uh, a declaration, the basis of which they called for comprehensive democratic change in Syria. Uh, definitely, Iraq was an important factor. Uh, many of us felt that uh, 
we didn't need uh, external invasion to do this. This had to be uh, an indigenous internal movement. Uh, but we were very clear um, that we would accept a role for Bashar al-Assad to lead this process, but it, ha you know, it has to, de to lead at the end into a democratic Syria. Again, there was a crackdown. The leading figures were arrested in 2008, uh, and they were sentenced to prison. Um, we wait till 2011, and uh, with the um, stage was set in Tunisia, Egypt, Syria was not isolated. There was a debate, how long will it take for Syria? Uh, many of us felt it was coming. Uh, but we were debated how long, and um, I think by March of 2011, uh, the spark came from a city in the south, Dara, you see it right um, by the Jordanian uh, border, uh, in which uh, small children, uh, young children, wrote on the wall uh, the same slogans of the Egyptian revolution, the, the Tahrir Square revolution, that we want freedom, it's your time, your time is up, Bashar al-Assad as a dictator, they were arrested, tortured, their family went to ask for their release, uh, they were too, they were insulted, people took into the street, and the regime immediately opened fire at the first demonstration. Uh, so this is, again, I'm giving just a background into how we got to this point. And then tell us how the coalition came about, how it's perceived today. It seems like it, it does have some difficulties uh, forming and unifying. Tell us about the coalition a little bit. Okay. The coalition, I think, is the third phase of a movement of the opposition. The first phase was uh, one of Syrians getting together, trying to show solidarity and support of demonstrators. Remember, this is a, a revolution that started peaceful. For the first seven months, it was all peaceful, and the regime never stopped killing Syrians for a single day. Trying to keep the number at, you know, below 20. That was the, the magic number. Um, so during the, the uh, conference phase, it was an idea to create some kind of a leadership, a voice for the revolution outside because the inside was never, in fact, uh, given the opportunity to develop its own leadership. I mean, unlike Egypt, Tunisia, even Libya, where leaders came from within, the level of repression in Syria will not allow something like this to happen. Uh, the leaders from within, they were in prison, uh, they were uh, assassinated. Um, they were always, you know, forced to leave the country. So that was phase one. Phase two was the creation of the Syrian National Council. It was a different level in which different groups got together and formed um, this group with, again, clear platform with the two objectives of, in fact, um, leading transition uh, into a democratic Syria without Bashar al-Assad in it. Uh, after that, we felt the Syrian National Council reached a certain uh, deadlock, that uh, it reached certain limits. So we felt we needed to expand a little bit. And so the new coalition was created last November, included, in addition to the SNC, Syrian National Council, representative of local councils. Those are the councils which were formed inside Syria, 14 representatives uh, representing the 14 provinces of Syria, governorate. Uh, they were part of the new coalition. And in addition to these two groups, there was uh, the public figures, the activists, the opposition um, leading figures. That's what constituted the coalition. Immediately after that, uh, in a meeting in Morocco, the coalition was recognized by 114 countries as the legitimate representative of the Syrian people. And that recognition, of course, um, included the US. Uh, so that's a kind of a brief And do you background. consider yourself an interim government, or is, it, is that how you view it? Well, we view the coalition uh, with about 70 members as a mini parliament. And from its inception, we had the idea that we need to have a, an executive branch uh, of the coalition, which we are in the process of creating, uh, creating an interim government. Uh, we hope that would materialize within the next two weeks. Uh, we had the vision of unifying all of the Free Syrian Army units under one umbrella. And uh, so parallel to the coalition, there was the work of the Supreme Military Council under the command of General Salim Idris, somebody that uh, um, I think many of you might have heard this name. Uh, and in fact, our friends did help bring together all, the, all of these factions of the FSA. The FSA now, the Supreme Military Council, does command more than 80% of the fighters on the ground. So uh, you have an executive branch, you have a legislative branch, and we have a small um, kind of legal judicial committee within the coalition, which is the basis of a judiciary. So that's, that's the structure of okay. the coalition. And we'll talk about that 20% okay. if you don't control in a minute. Okay. All right. So. Let's, let's get into the meat of the matter. If you could bring up slide six, please. So, as, as, as you will correct me, I know some of these numbers are already out of date, you're telling me. Right. But certainly the death toll is more than 70,000. 
we had, when we last looked, it was two million people displaced, but now you are telling me it's three million. It's actually uh, about close to four million. All right, yeah. and if you go to slide four, these numbers come from the United Nations, which, you know, obviously the numbers aren't quite as up to date, but we have the most recent, is more than a three quarters of a million people uh, who are official refugees. You're telling me now that's over a million, is that That's correct? over a million, according to the UN agency. That number, the threshold of right. a million already passed. All right. So first question here on this is, give us a sense of what things are like on the ground. You know, it looked like the rebel forces were making a lot of advances. Now it seems more of a stalemate. Help us understand what's going on there and what the trends are. Okay, well, um, as I said, this revolution started peaceful. So for the first six months, it was that way. Um, the regime was using, uh, for the most part, snipers to crack down and kill people. The mentality was they want to bring back um, the wall of fear that Syrians finally were able to uh, rid themselves of. Um, as the um, brutality increased uh, and repression increased, um, we started to see two simultaneous trends. One, um, members of the military were defecting. Uh, most of the cases were refusing to open fire at their fellow citizens. And so they, they, they constituted the nucleus of the Free Syrian Army. And the second one, you have young people um, taking up weapons in self-defense. And that, in fact, led to the militarization of the Syrian revolution that none of, none of us, in fact, wanted. And nobody made a conscious decision to make it that way. For many of us, the, we had a several models with the Arab Spring. Our ideal model was Tunisia and Egypt. We wanted you know, that model. We didn't want Libya. By then, Libya was going you know, militarized. Um, uh, Yemen was halfway in between. So um, as things you know, became more militarized and people were, in fact, uh, taking up um, resistance and an armed resistance um, in, in legitimate self-defense, uh, we see th that trend. Uh, the regime from day one wanted to, in fact, push things into that direction. Uh, you hear to the president's advisor in the first week talking about they are faced with armed extremist groups. For the first time, that did not exist. So they were, in fact, hoping they would create that because they have supremacy when it comes to the use of weapons. I mean, they have the arsenal, they have the know-how, they have the structures to crack down and, and repress this movement. But Syrian people decided to, to fight back, and, and by now I think we know that at least 60 to 70 percent of Syria is outside the control of the regime. We call it liberated area, but it's not actually fully liberated because the regime is able to inflict a lot of damage. And, and the latest escalation in terms of weaponry, again, they went from snipers to machine guns, artillery, tanks, and now the latest they're using air force and Scud missiles, and of course the latest one, which we'll talk about, we'll it, talk chemical about weapons. So uh, right now, I think the Free Syrian Army was able to make a lot of strides. Uh, we have the size of the Syri Free Syrian Army is estimated about 160,000. There is a small extremist, um, uh, I would say, you know, group of within that. Maybe you could address it later. Uh, but with their own resources, they were able to make all of these achievements. Uh, the main problem with the Free Syrian Army is the lack of basic ammunition basic ammunition. And lately with the escalation and use of uh, Air Force and, and Scud missiles, they've been demanding strategic weaponry. Uh, I could say here, uh, at one point, Syrians, uh, peaceful demonstrators, were demanding the international community to intervene to provide civilian protection. They witnessed Libya, they felt Libya was a model, and they too deserve a Security Council resolution. That never came, unfortunately, because of the uh, um, you know, destructive role of, of Russia. Uh, they used, of course, uh, the veto three times with China. Uh, but I think eventually Syrians uh, were no longer calling for foreign intervention. They feel they can do the job on their own. What they're asking today is, um, again, basic ammunition, strategic weaponry to be able to topple the Assad regime. Um, with the use of chemical weapons, again, I think this is complicating things, and, and maybe we'll talk more. We'll get that in a second, but let's talk about the radical Islamic fighters, since that is sort of the big elephant in the room. Yeah. The, the, the West and the United States particularly are very fearful, and that is one of the reasons they cite as to not why they're not arming the rebels, because they don't want arms going into the wrong hands. You indicate that that's a smaller group, but how big is the Al-Qaeda, the radical Islamist fighters? How big a force is that, and is that, should that be a real concern to the West? Well, it's uh, first and foremost, it's a concern for us Syrians. Uh, we don't want Syria to, you know, drift into becoming a failed state, and we don't want Syria to become a fertile ground for 
extremist groups. I mean, that's, that's our main concern. And that's why we do understand the concerns raised in the West um, by our friends about Nusra, which is affiliated with Al-Qaeda. But I, I do want to say, again, in terms of providing a little bit of history about this, um, a lot of these extremist groups were actually the creation of the Assad regime. A lot of these young people were trained by Assad to go to Iraq and kill Americans. I think this is, this is part of the history. Some of them um, lately decided to come back. They felt like since they are Syrian, it made more sense for them to come back and fight the Assad regime. So that's one, one segment of, of those. And um, they came back, again, a year ago, there was no such thing as a Nusra in Syria. You would not hear it. They um, found a you know, vacuum, which they were able to fill. Um, what really made them kind of attract young Syrians, uh, two facts. Number one, they are effective fighters. They have you know, the training, the experience, and they were able to get weapons from you know, certain uh, regional uh, maybe supporters. Um, and in some cases, uh, they, are, they developed their reputation and they kind of learning from other examples. They wanted the, this you know, kind of populist support base. And so they're trying to you know, engage in protecting properties. They're trying to provide some services in some cases. Um, to us, this is definitely a serious concern, but the way to do it is to support the moderate forces. And the moderate forces are the main um, fighters. Again, we're talking 160,000. The numbers I heard from people who are close to the military ground, they say 2,000, 2,500. That's, that's the size of this group. That's it? 2, yes. 000. Okay. So, given that, do you feel the United States should start arming the rebels? Yes. Um, the, as I said, um, in, with the failure of the Security Council to take up its responsibility in providing protections for civilians in Syria, and the fact that Russia uh, vetoed three resolutions, out of the first veto came out the forming of the Friends of Syria. That's, you know, regional group. Started with the 60-some countries in Istanbul, uh, in Tunisia, I'm sorry, and uh, it reached now 116 countries. Um, the good news about this, we are in the company of the community of democracies, of the civilized countries of the world. You look at the other side, look at the countries that vetoed the General Assembly resolution last August at the UN. It's Russia, it's Belarus, North Korea, Cuba, Venezuela. So that's, I think, is, is, is a good news. Now, um, I think our, our friends are providing humanitarian assistance, which they are, we are grateful for. Uh, our neighboring countries have taken, in fact, a lot of... Uh, responsibilities in hosting refugees. Countries like Turkey, um, they have, again, they passed the 600,000. Uh, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, and, and lately Iraq. They're, they're really trying their best to deal with the mass uh, exodus of refugees. Uh, the second aspect, they are supporting us politically. Uh, but we believe that uh, in the light of the fact that the regime had a huge arsenal of weaponry that's using it, continues to receive weapons from Iran, Russia, and lately Iraq, it's only fair that the Free Syrian Army has the right for self-defense. And so some countries like the Gulf countries have been providing weapons, but it's been really limited, not enough to change the military balance on the ground. Are you including heavy weapons? Yes, I mean, uh, you know what? Uh, most of the weapons the Free Syrian Army, in fact, has today was able to obtain um, by taking over certain military bases. Um, but I think uh, giving the Free Syrian Army strategic weaponry, anti-aircraft, anti-tank, will change the military balance on the ground. That's why we want clearly European countries, the U.S., to be involved in that, in that process. And um, the military leaders, they had a clear system of guaranteeing that those weapons will not go into the, the wrong hands. But that's, that's, there's no guarantee there, obviously. Well, I mean, you know, today's uh, technology, and I'm not an expert, I heard from the military commanders that you could actually trace anti-aircraft missiles, you know, and you could disable them in today's technology. And you could train specific officers to ha you have these weapons, and you could assure that they are part of the mainstream. So there are a lot of, you know, ways. But I think sometimes it's the easy way to say, you know, oh, we are afraid to do that, we don't take action. I think the problem has been the lack of political will and the lack of leadership on the Obama administration. Honestly, this is our main issue with this All administration. Right. Well, speaking of the Obama administration, he, the president set a line in the sand, and that was the use of chemical weapons. As we know now, there has been some apparent use of chemical weapons. President Obama held a press conference this morning. I would like to play just briefly a clip of what he had to say on this issue. Can you play the video, please? To that, that genie out of the bottle. 
so what I said that uh, the use of chemical weapons would be a game changer, uh, that wasn't unique to, that wasn't a position unique to the United States, uh, and it shouldn't have been a surprise. Uh, and what we now have is evidence that chemical weapons have been used inside of Syria, but we don't know how they were used, when they were used, who used them. We don't have a chain of uh, custody that establishes what exactly happened. And when I am making decisions about uh, America's national security and the potential for taking additional action uh, in response to chemical weapon use, I've got to make sure I've got the facts. That's what the American people would expect. Uh, and if we end up rushing to judgment without hard, effective evidence, then we can find ourselves in a position where we can't mobilize the international community to support what we do. There may be objections even among some people in the region who are sympathetic with the opposition if we take action. So, number one, if you have any information about this use of chemical weapons, if you would share that. Number two, how do you feel about the president's approach here? Um, the first time we heard uh, of um, instance of the you know, allegation of use of chemical weapons um, happened a couple of months ago uh, in the town of Homs, um, one of the center uh, of the country actually. You see it uh, uh, close to the northeast part of Lebanon. Uh -huh. um, and at the time, um, we were very careful you know, because we heard the president saying this is a red line, this is a game changer, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I heard that uh, some of the doctors were able to collect some of the evidence, which in fact was passed to the U.S. and, and other friendly countries. Um, and then uh, there were two at least other cases of documented use. And I remember uh, one time we were in Turkey and it was in, in Aleppo and reports were coming from the hospital that all of the symptoms of those who suffered, uh, suffered you know, exposure to certain uh, gas, and, and again, I'm no expert, but that, that was the case. What we know today is that at least the UK, France, and the US said we have evidence that it was used. So that red line again was crossed from our point of view. And knowing the mentality of the Assad regime, I mean, I think they were trying to test the will of the international community in, in a way. Uh, their use was very tactical, very small, and they want to see, in fact, if they could, um, to which extent they could get away with it. The danger of this, I think, is if the regime gets into a desperate point, they might, you know, try to use it as mass scale in order to instill fear at large scale and try to change the whole, you know, kind of balance on, on, in Syria. So it is a very, um, you know, concerning to us. Well, you know what? Um, it's very simple. If, if there is still not enough, you know, evidence, take the issue to the Security Council, get Russia on board, say this is something, you know, we should all be united, send a clear message, two things. There is a, an investigation team sitting in Cyprus, let them go to the country, investigate. It's in fact, actually, it's, it's really interesting that the regime's representative at the UN uh, called for the investigation, and we totally support that call. We are open that this investigation should be open to all Syria, and the question that we don't know who used it under what circumstances, it's our you know, sources tell us the only regime has chemical weapons and access to them and ability to use them. As far as we know, the Free Syrian Army doesn't have it. But if they were implicated, I think they should be condemned. It's very clear. It's very clear. This, is, this should not be used. And so I think, again, go through the Security Council, push the investigation, send a unified message through the Security Council, including Russia, that this should not be used. And I think we should work with our allies to secure those arsenal during the transition and post-Assad. So I'm going to ask one more question, then we're going to go to questions from the audience. So we, hopefully we have a couple of microphones. That just raise your hand and we'll get to you. So where does this go from here? Are we talking, this is two years in now. How much longer, what's the end game look like to you? The end game um, is from, you know, the way we see it, it's a Syria without Assad. There's going to be a difficult transition. Um, we believe transition had already begun in Syria. Um, and um, again, by forming the coalition, by forming these institutions like the Supreme Military Council, by setting an interim government uh, to provide governance to the liberated areas and, and be able, in fact, uh, to take over uh, the state institutions. We are very clear about sustaining the state institution. 
and not undermine, undermining them. We have a clear distinction between the state and the regime. Um, so despite all of the challenges, we believe that the transition uh, will reach that logical conclusion. From our point of view, is always the challenge is to lower the cost of the transition, especially the human cost and the material destruction to the country, which has been too high. So that's really how we see it. We have no doubt how this is going to end. Again, um, I think changing the military balance on the ground is going to be an important factor. We do keep the prospect of a political solution. Um, again, but in order to do that, you have to uh, allow the Free Syrian Army to, to change the military balance on the ground. Um, and uh, we're gonna have a long, uh, clear transitional process. We created a project called The Day After. I could talk about it in more details, in which we have vision about maintaining law and order, transitional justice, uh, constitutional design, security sector reform, all of those areas. The fact that we had more time to think about these issues, I think, is good news. But in order to, to, to get to The Day After, we need the help of the allies to get rid of this regime. Can you see him going peacefully? Uh, we, uh, we keep that door, you know, open, I doubt, knowing the mentality. It seems like there is a manual they all read from. It's the Gaddafi manual, I mean, and Saddam. And, um, uh, you know, we, in the past, we, we were calling for our friends to help us find a way. In fact, the main Arab initiative to find political solution was a Yemeni model, in which we would ask him to step down, uh, you know, or, or delegate his power to the vice president, in which he would oversee a political process in which both sides would be involved. That was turned down, rejected. Um, it's again, as you know, this uh, you know, as the more they commit crimes against humanity, the more difficult for him and his cronies yeah. to find a way out. Okay, so the gentleman right here has a microphone. It's not work. Oh, it does work. Um, given the situation in Egypt, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the day after. How do you think that the different parts uh, in the opposition can come together and agree, namely about uh, your border from from South Israel? And, and everything that has to do with that. I, I'm not sure I understand. I mean, you said Egypt and the... the I'm saying, given the situation in Egypt uh, and the hard time that they, in a way, have uh, now reached an agreement of all the people who are part of the revolution, I wonder about your thoughts uh, about the ability of the, of the current opposition in Syria to reach an agreement the day after Assad has fled from, from Syria, especially about Israel. Well, you know, um, transition is never easy. And each country has its own circumstances. Um, the, the good departing point for Syria is that Syrians want to create a model that uh, looks anything but the Assad model of the one-party state of this regime based on security repression. Um, so there is a lot of eagerness to really move to an inclusive, pluralistic, democratic Syria. Um, I think it's, um, in this process, I think it's always uh, you face the challenge of balancing two forces. From one hand, you do want to create a strengthened and national, Syrian national identity. At the same time, you do want to account for diversity. Diversity on all grounds, not only religious, ethnic, but political diversity, and allow all of these you know, uh, uh, forces to compete. Um, and it takes, it takes time. I mean, as we've seen in Egypt, even though the Egyptian society is not as divided, maybe, as, as Syrian, uh, but the fact that sometimes if political players don't keep their eyes on the, the rules of the game and preserving th those rules, uh, the whole transition could be, in fact, um, you know, um, basically at danger. Um, I think we are uh, lucky to observe what happened in Egypt, in Tunisia, and to see what went right and what went wrong, and try to avoid some of the uh, mishaps of Egypt. For instance, I tell you in our constitutional design workshop, uh, I, I made the joke, had Morsi attended the seminar, he would have not made the mistakes he, you know, he made in Egypt. Uh, the process is so important. You need an inclus inclusive process in order to design a, a constitution that's legitimate. It's not about the content. So I think we are, in fact, lucky that we had the time to observe some of those uh, lessons and learn from them. Who has this be somebody with the microphone? So right there. It's good to see well. Milken Institute include this in our dialogue. Thank you for being here. Quick question for you. What do you think the underlying hand of Iran, even during and post Assad, number one, number two, and using mosques and mullahs to destabilize or continue the fingering of the process? Uh, Thank you. We don't have mullahs in Syria, um, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, mosques were actually uh, important 
um, I would say, areas from which demonstrators came out. Um, because it's the only place where people could gather. This is during the peaceful uh, phase of the revolution. But I assure you, even our Christian colleagues were going to the mosque so they would gather and go into, into demonstrations. Um, I, again, I think um, the, the uh, threat of having a more religious... I'm sorry? I'll talk about the Iran role in a second. Um, I think Syrians mostly are more, um, you know, first it's a very diverse country. You don't have a um, clear, like, you know, 98% Sunnis like in Libya. Uh, but at the same time, the Sunnis in Syria are more, I think, you know, I would say close to being secular. So the fear of a theocratic religious state in Syria is really exaggerated. Um, you're shaking your head, but uh, that, that's, that, that, that's my assessment. Um, I think the role of Iran, from our point of view, has been very destructive. Um, uh, Iran is a regional uh, power. Um, Syria, Assad the father, had a relationship with Iran that benefited actually both countries, regardless of what I think about Assad's domestic uh, politics. He was able to balance his relations with the Gulf countries and, and benefit economically, strategically, etc. With Bashar al-Assad, Bashar al-Assad made Syria into a junior partner in its relations with Iran. So it became um, serving Iranians' interests, which most Syrians don't agree with that vision of of Syria and its place. Most of us see Syria, Syria's place within the moderate Arab camp. Uh, Syria is that contributing to peace and stability in the region. Um, and definitely, um, at one point, uh, Hezbollah had some popularity in Syria because it stood up to Israel. But after um, deciding clearly with the repression and the killing and taking direct role, uh, the most hated country today in Syria is Iran. It's not Israel. It's not the US. Um, because they are directly involved, implicated in the killing. We, in the future, we want to have normal relations with Iran based on mutual interest, um, and I think they still have an opportunity to change sides. Um, but it's been already uh, so damaging. Well, our next question comes from someone I assume you know from the State Department, Bob Hormat. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Thank you very much for a very, very thoughtful presentation. I wanted to follow up one point you made quite effectively the diversity of Syria as opposed to say Libya or many other countries. And I think in the end, as you say, the goal is a free Syria. But in the interim, there are a number of steps along the way that could lead to a more fragmented Syria. And I just wanted to test one proposition with you. First of all, those refugee figures that you've indicated are very frightening because it, it could be a sinkhole that destabilizes Jordan, half a million people, a million by the end of the year, the king indicates, another half a million next year. Lebanon, which is already relatively unstable, and more people going over there, and even some Druze coming into Israel right. is not, a, not an impossible thing, not as many. But here's the proposition, and that is, on the way, there's always a risk, as you've indicated, with Iran providing support, particularly to Hezbollah, that you could have a breakup of entities, not necessarily break up the state. You could have an Alawite entity protected by or supported by the Hezbollah on the west. You could have the Druze sort of congregating in the south and moving across. You could have a Sunni or a fragmented Sunni entity in the central part of the country, which is very hard for anyone to govern. And then you could have the Kurds working with the Iraqi Kurds and the, and the Turkish Kurds in the northeast. My worry is that at some point before you get to the final state, unified state, you could have a very fragmented state where Assad retreats, Hezbollah supports him, he's on the border with Lebanon, Hezbollah continues to have its access to beleaguer Israel with the support of the Iranians. How do you, how do you go about dealing with that kind of, of transitional, highly disruptive uh, state to get to the final state? Is that a concern we should worry about? And how does the FSA deal with that? Can I, can I add one piece to that? Sure. I think, to simplify it, one rebel commander was recently quoted in The Economist as saying, I am worried that when this is done, there won't be a country left. That's the, that's the well, th those are definitely serious concerns. But, but those would be the nightmare scenarios and the worst scenarios for Syria. And if this goes on for longer, I mean, the prospect of a failed state is there. You, you see that that's where you know, the, the trend can be uh, moving. But I think what we're trying to do is precisely to avert that scenario. 
with our allies and friends and, and everybody else. Uh, there is a commitment among all political players uh, to preserve the territorial integrity of Syria, as is. And, and this is something, in fact, we're trying to have commitments from all, not only our friends, but even including countries like Russia, which they say they are committed to that. So that's, you know, keeps the door, in fact, open for engagement uh, with Russia, even, even if they continue to support Assad to the, to, to the very end. Uh, I think in terms of, even though Syria is a, is a diverse country, there is a clear majority. And if you take the two elements of identity of Arabism and Islam, you have about 90%, 92% of Syria's Arabs and about 90% are Muslims, you know, if we include the Alawite 10%, um, one sect of, of the, uh, the Muslim religion. Um, there is a clear 73, 74% Sunni Arabs. That, that's, I think, the thing is, while all of these minorities are present, they don't constitute a majority in any single region which makes it difficult for them to try to carve up, you know, a territory. For instance, the Kurds, even though they are concentrated in the Northeast, they are not a majority. Um, one other element for the Kurds, they are part of the opposition. So they are committed to a democratic um, solution for the Kurdish question. The only really concern is the Alawite uh, concern. And uh, here I, I do want to say uh, you cannot create a viable Alawite state in the coastal area without uh, engaging in a mass uh, sectarian cleansing which we believe they are, they are, you're right. And I think the good news, the good news is that you don't see actually retaliation. One of the things, despite everything, and sometimes in fact, you know, uh, easily we describe what's happening in Syria as a civil war. It's not a civil war. It's not a civil war between two equal parties fighting on the basis of ethnicity or religion or, you know, like what happened in Lebanon in, in 75 to, to 1990. Um, I think again, it's my understanding that part of the planning of the Syrian, Free Syrian Army is to, again, prevent the prospect of uh, disintegrating, dividing Syria. So some of the military planning is going to that direction. Politically, we are, again, we are committed to uh, preserving the unity of Syria uh, by, in fact, engaging all of these groups to be part of the solution, including those Alawites who have not, in fact, joined or stayed on the fence. Um, we do offer a clear message to them. They are, they are, they are actually partners. Uh, only those who committed crimes against Syrians will not be accepted in the future of Syria. So, yes, I mean, if, and this is why, again, uh, our message to the international community, we need your help to end this soon. Because a failed state on the border of all of these countries, including Israel, is not going to serve anyone. It's, in fact, it's, uh, it could have the spillover into all of these other countries. You already see uh, this division in Iraq between Sunnis and Shiites. You see what's happening in Lebanon. So it's really the responsibility of the international community, especially our friends, to uh, help us preserve Syria. Here, and then Morgan. Uh, thank you again very much for coming. Uh, can you tell us uh, approximately how much of the economy is controlled by the Assad regime and how you're thinking about a, a smooth uh, economic transition, if it's a material amount, uh, is, you know, to, to complement the, the political transition that you have expected when he falls? This is a difficult question, um, because what we have today is a war economy. Um, but looking at um, the percentage that the Assad controls, uh, mostly a um, large part of Damascus, some of the other uh, cities, uh, it's really hard to, to, to give, again, numbers and figures. As I said, 60 to 65% of the territory is outside that control, uh, which makes it, again, you know, you have the conditions of groups trying to fill in this, this vacuum to provide some economic governance. Uh, that's why I think we focus on the local councils to provide those basic services, uh, to provide relief uh, with the international agencies and um, Syrian, um, again, uh, agencies and uh, working cross borders. Um, we do believe that this is going to be, in fact, one of the most crucial ways of providing stability during the transition. That's why we look forward to work with our international partners. Our estimate in the transition to move to a really stable Syria, you need about $60 billion. That's some figures um, presented by some of uh, our economist colleagues. Um, in the short term, what we're trying to do now, and that's why we're working so hard to create this interim government, is to create about 11 basic ministries and three commissions, uh, maybe with about 50 to 100 in each ministry, and to move in into the uh, you know, liberated areas and take care of basic services, try to create success spot models that, in fact, you could build in. 
but we are, our second phase is to be able, and we expect the Assad to abandon public employees, to be able to embrace them, to be able to provide them with support. So again, we could preserve the state institution. Uh, this is very important in, in our thinking, in our planning. Um, we have some figures, I mean, kind of rough estimate. For the first three months of the government, interim government, you need about 150, 200 million dollars to run just the basic function. But we are very uh, committed to have this government work inside Syria. Even its headquarters are going to be on the border with Turkey. It's not going to be in any outside capital. It's not an exile government. It's a very important message. And we are already working with the local councils. We are training the local councils to increase their reach to Syrians and to improve that quality. Those are some of the things, in fact, our friends have offered us, and we are grateful to many countries that have been doing a lot of this work. Um, the securing, again, um, a stable economy um, is going to be one of the most um, difficult challenges facing post-Assad Syria. But we, we believe we have some elements um, that are going to help us. Syria has uh, excellent you know, human resources. I could give you just the example of how Syrian living abroad been so extremely supportive, in fact, of Syrians. Syrian American communities raised $42 million just in relief assistance to their fellow Syrians. Um, so you have a good base of agriculture, limited oil. And by the way, now oil is outside the control of the government. We're trying to find ways maybe to use that to provide some sources of funding for the interim government. Um, we have some small industries. I think one of the major, again, short-term challenges, resettling refugees, which brings me to the question of the necessity of providing some safe zone to, you know, create those conditions. Refugees are willing to come back, but they know that the regime is firing Scud missiles. I think this is where we need to explore with our friends and allies possibilities of creating limited safe zone. Um, so it's all connected together, I think. But we see those elements, and we are committed again to really bringing some degree of stability, some degree of um, the conditions that are conducive uh, to providing good economic governance to those areas. Speaking of the economy and numbers, you gave me a very scary number on the unemployment rate today in Syria. You want to share that? It's estimated about 70%. Yeah. 70%. Morgan? Or, I thought you had the, sorry. Who else? Okay. <laughs> who, has a, who has the microphone? I have it over here. Skip? Where are you? Skip? They're in the back. Yeah. Okay. Could you be really specific on what you want President Obama to do, say, tomorrow? Um, I would like him to show leadership on Syria in three areas. Politically, I would like him to always speak um, uh, of support of the Syrian people and their rights to achieve and complete this transition. For instance, when we speak about political settlement, uh, you see somebody like Lavrov, he's been the spokesperson for the Assad, always, uh, you, know, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, trying to assert that Assad must be part of the process. That's not the American interpretation. That's nobody's interpretation. We would like the administration to take a clear stance on that, that any solution should not involve Bashar al-Assad. The president has not been, uh, you know, kind of personally speaking on that. And I think there are some symbolism to the president taking that political leadership. Not only, I mean, just speaking, in fact, leading the coalition. We have this great coalition that's providing all kind of support for, for Syrians, uh, but you feel there is a really lack of leadership on, on key issues. Economically, I think, and here I must give a lot of you know, credit to the increased support that the administration is, is committed itself to, both relief and capacity building through the coalition. So we welcome that very much. Third area is military. Um, the administration spoke about the non-lethal support uh, of the FSA. We welcome that. I think that's a great step. In that non-lethal, there's wide range of issues can be, in fact, you know, uh, taken, intelligence, communication, etc. But I think uh, what was uh, needed in the past, I think the uh, U.S. administration up to, I would say, November, early, early December, was even um, expressing concern for our allies to give weapons, especially strategic weaponry. I don't think that's any longer the case. Uh, but the U.S. can provide a lot of, again, in areas like training, um, the questions of safe zone. I think the U.S. can take leadership on both sides of the borders, Turkey and, and, and uh, Jordan. Uh, we don't want boots on the ground. This is clear. And we agree with the administration on that. But I think between doing um, uh, full in invasion and intervention and, and what's really not been done in the military 
political area, there's a wide range of options that we should work together with the administration to explore, be creative. Uh, the good news is that there are a lot of allies who are eager to provide more support, but they are looking for leadership from the White House. And I think we would like to see that. Back here, sir. Here. Um, we talked earlier about the lessons that we can draw from the Egyptian or Tunisian experience. We didn't talk about Libya, where still today, after more than a year of transition, there is a problem with convincing the militias to disarm. What, how do you envisage the transition in Syria as far as this is concerned? Will we dismantle the Syrian army? What about the militias? How will we convince them to, to, to relinquish their arms after two years of a, a very wild uh, situation? Um, I think it's, it's an excellent question. Um, uh, we believe that this is going to be again in the area of security is the most challenging maybe uh, area and including to the question about the economy and providing you know jobs and stability. Um, the creation of this Supreme Military Council um, under the leadership of Salim Idris who by the way has a PhD in physics, he's not a traditional military officer, um, is clearly committed to creating a national army that is uh, under the political leadership of the coalition and the transitional government and a future democratic government. Um, I think we developed within the day after project a whole section on security sector reform. I think our problem with the Syrian army as it exists today is that you have these special units that's carrying out most of the killing and repression. I think those should be dismantled. But the, the rest of the army, I think, uh, as, as much as we can preserve, we should. Again, we are cognizant of what happened of Iraq and, and the way things were mismanaged there. So, you know, as I think of, of Libya, I think of Iraq at the same time. Um, but I think it's clearly that uh, uh, the vision of the military commanders is to create um, a professional army uh, committed to protecting Syria, not a regime, which is a, going to be a major shift in defining the mission of the army um, under Assad. Um, and, and you're going to give a, an opportunity to those civilians in the army. Either they could join or they must disarm. But we have to have a timetable for that. So we have been looking into, in fact, some uh, proposals, ideas. We are very, very, again, following what's happening in Libya. We don't want that to be repeated. Uh, but it's not going to be easy, honestly. Right here, sir. Yeah, uh, I obviously really applaud what you're trying to do. I mean, it's very, very tough, and I feel terrible about what's happening in Syria, but, um, you know, there's very little political will in the United States to um, get involved in yet another Middle Eastern conflict, and, you know, just to try to think outside the box a little bit, I, I kind of wonder, wouldn't it make sense to um, revisit how the borders were originally drawn 100 years ago by the British, um, and maybe, you know, just sort of... <laughs> I guess the French too, um, and uh, and and because obviously these ethnic groups are not getting along properly, and maybe they should be more like the Balkans and have their own countries. Um, I have my own ideas of redrawing the borders. Um, it's uh, I would rather have democratic go government in each country and engage in political integration a la European Union rather than, you know, kind of uh, dividing along ethnic. And I, f I think if we open that, that you know, Pandora box, it it's going to be, it's going to open the door for a lot of endless conflict in the, in the short run. Uh, again, as I said in Syria, uh, you don't have any clear group with a majority in any area. That's why even a notion of having a federal system is not very viable in Syria. I think what we could have in Syria is um, local decentralization, and it's part actually of our political vision for areas like the Kurdish area, uh, where again other groups are, are involved. Um, and um, again, you know, I don't think, uh, with the exception of the Kurds actually, n we don't have other groups who are demanding to have their own state within Syria. Um, some people say Assad might, as a last resort, you know, um, retrieve into that Alawite enclave, but, but that's, he's gonna be like more, more of a militia, you know, and then you have to deal with it, you know, by providing all kind of, you know, strategy uh, toward that. So I, I would not, again, uh, really propose, I would not encourage those kind of reconsidering Sykes-Picot and the redrawing of, of, of the borders. Uh, again, I think my solution to the region 
um, democratic governance, political integration, economic integration, leading, I mean, you know what Turkey tried to do before the Arab Spring? They had the, this policy of you know, allowing uh, people to move freely among the borders. You don't need visas. I think th this is a kind of model we should encourage, which could address some of the grievances of groups who are cross borders, like the, the Kurds, for instance, um, but not by violent means. I think this is going to create more problems than, in fact, find solutions. Go ahead. Uh, yes, what, um, coming back to the original question, what does the coalition have to offer Israel and what does the coalition want from Israel? What can Israel do for the coalition? What will they get in return? We don't want anything from Israel. <laughs> um, well, no, I mean, I think Israel's position is, is um, a difficult one. Um, from one hand, as I understand, I mean, a lot of people, like everywhere, they're concerned about the human aspect of what's happening in Syria. Uh, they're definitely concerned about the rise of extremism, the prospect of having, you know, failed state. And um, from our point of view, again, um, you know, those are concerns of ours as well. Uh, for as far as Israel, I mean, we have a formula. We have an occupied territory called the Golan Heights. Um, post Assad, I think, democratically elected government would have to decide how to proceed with that. But we do believe, actually, a lot of the work had been done. Uh, how to solve this issue by peaceful means with Israel. And, uh, but I, I would say that Syria's post-Assad is going to be concerned mostly with rebuilding, with human development, with resettling, with all of those issues. So it's not going to be a threat to its neighbors. I mean, I, I don't think that's going to be high on the priority of, of you know, any future democratic uh, government in Syria. Uh, so um, it's a clear issue. You know, you have this occupied territory. There are ways to solve that conflict by peaceful means. Let me take one more question, if there is one. If not, can you get the microphone? We've heard about the role of other countries in the Middle East. You've spoken about the possible role of the United States, of Russia, of France, Egypt. What role, if any, should the United Nations play in the current problems in Syria? Uh, well, the United Nations, from the Syria's point of view, Syrians' population's point of view, has actually failed to st stand up to its responsibility in protecting civilians, unfortunately. We have the Security Council uh, paralyzed to take any action on, on Syria. Uh, but we still believe the United Nations has a lot to offer. In fact, I'm now working mostly in New York with the United Nations. Uh, in areas of relief, I think the UN is doing a lot through OCHA, UNICEF, other groups. And so we need to work with the institutions of the UN uh, to provide immediate relief uh, and support for the refugees. Uh, we, we could see the UN taking a leading role on transition. Uh, the Secretariat can, in fact, have a team. They can have a mandate from the General Assembly, not even from the Security Council. And they are doing some of that work, and we are uh, in touch with them. Um, I think on the questions of um, uh, providing civilian protect, you know, protection of civilians, there are ways to do it, even outside the Security Council. Um, right now, there is a, a resolution being considered at the General Assembly, uh, which brings Syria back to the UN, um, in which, again, it would address humanitarian issues, it would address uh, condemning the use of violence, especially SCUD missiles, escalation of, you know, uh, it could work, it could in fact work on the chemical weapons. I think this is an area where, with U.S. leadership, should be brought back to the Security Council, and Russia must in fact uh, put before its responsibility uh, to be at least constructive. So I think th there are multiple of things the United Nations can, can do and should do. Um, but if, again, um, Russia continues to be uh, that obstructive you know, country at, at the Security Council, the General Assembly is there. Um, at one point, in fact, after the coalition became uh, the legitimate representative of the Syrian people and got the seat of Syria at the Arab League, I think we should contest the regime representation at the United Nations. We should, uh, again, through the General Assembly, say this regime does not belong to the community of nations. It should be further delegitimized, and we are going to contest that when the right moment comes. So there are a lot of things can be done through the UN, and we are going to work with the UN uh, to achieve these goals. Two final questions. One, what's the thing that most keeps you up at night? Uh, 
waking up the next morning and uh, hoping the numbers of Syrians killed will go below 100. Um, uh, today, the latest number was 100, 105, and it's still you know, not over. Uh, the numbers has been between 150 to 200. Our obsession, as many of us, is how to, again, uh, end the killing. That's really um, the, the, our most important concern. Um, while at the same time, continue to proceed uh, with our objective of moving into a, a free, inclusive, democratic Syria. So to, from my point of view, it's always a uh, concern about the numbers who are killed. I have a lot of concerns about the status of refugees. Detainees, we believe the number is minimum 60,000. Um, on a daily basis, you have few numbers killed under torture. And you don't see a lot of concern. Uh, it's really disheartening to see that how the US media is not covering Syria. I mean, there is so little on Syria in, in, in the U.S. media. I mean, I do understand, you know, you see, like, we hear statements like the American public, you know, suffer from fatigue and they don't want another story, another involvement. But there are a lot can be done less than, you know, again, going and invading a country. We don't want that. We don't want any foreign country to come to Syria and militarily occupy Syria. But there are a lot can be done. So that's what keeps me up. And what gives you the most optimism that this will be solved relatively soon? Uh, Syrians inside, whenever we get so frustrated, disappointed, um, and some of us have been, in fact, my colleague has been to Syria several times, you go to talk to people and they are very hopeful. This is happening. Uh, they're not going to go back. Uh, they see um, this is, again, uh, kind of a, a cost they have to pay for 40 years of uh, oppression, of, of uh, corruption, of, of uh, really preventing people from living normal life, from uh, depriving people from lack of you know, basic opportunities. And I think it's finally happening. So people inside are very, very determined. They're very optimistic that it will, um, you know, it will be achieved and soon. God's willing, inshallah. Mr. Godwin, thank you so much. Please welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. You so much. I really appreciate it.